Turn in our Bibles to Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8, verse 5, all the way through to 25. Let's see if we can get a march on and get through that this evening. Um, there's a lot that goes on in there, but the, uh, at this point, the, I want to give you the important lesson, which we can see we can see from afar, we can get a bigger picture uh, and we can see what's happening here, why it's happening and the results of it. And there's two little surprises, the first one at the start, which isn't a major surprise, uh, and, and the second one about, uh, almost towards the end, which, yeah, there's a lot of debate about, but we'll see that when we get to it. First of all, we'll, we'll read through it, Acts chapter 8, <laughs> verse 5 through to 25. And he says there, Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. And the people, with one accord, gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits, crying with loud voice, came out of many that were possessed with them, and many taken with palsies that were lame were healed. And there was great joy in that city. But there was a certain man called Simon, which before time in the same city used sorcery and bewitched the people of Samaria, giving out that himself was some great one, to whom they all gave heed from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the, power, the great power of God. And to him they had regard, because that of long time he had bewitched them with sorceries. But when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, and they were baptised, both men and women. Then Simon himself believed also. And when he was baptised, he continued with Philip and, and, and wondered, beholding the miracles and signs which were done. Now when the apostles, which were at Jerusalem, heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John, who, when they were come down, prayed for them, that they might receive the Holy Ghost. For as yet he was falling upon none of them, only they were baptised in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. And when Simon saw that through laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me also this power, that on whomsoever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. But Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent therefore of this thy wickedness, and pray God, if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. For I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. Then answered Simon and said, Pray ye to the Lord for me, that none of these things which ye have spoken come upon me. And they, when they had testified and preached the word of the Lord, returned to Jerusalem and preached the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. So there's a lot going on there, but we can see the one big overriding story from the start to the finish there of Philip preaching in Samaria. So this Philip, though, was not the Apostle Philip. Okay, He was one of the first deacons. If we look back in Acts chapter 6, and verse 5, we'll see him there mentioned with, with Steve in Acts chapter 6, verse 5. And, and the same pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith in the Holy Ghost, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Pymenus, and Nicola, Nicholas, and, and the others. So we can see that, see that, that Philip right there. And, and we know this because of two indisputable accounts in this very same chapter. In verse 1 of this chapter, it tells us something that the apostles did. What did the apostles do in verse 1? Can anyone tell me? They stayed in Jerusalem. Okay, so the apostles stayed in Jerusalem. And then what does it say going down to verse... Verse 4... Oh, I've lost, I've lost my place. Verse 14. Verse, yeah, verse 14, sorry. Now, when the apostles, which were at Jerusalem, so the apostles are still there, see how that 
is eclipsed there by the apostles stayed in Jerusalem and the apostles at Jerusalem. So we know that this Philip here has, has, has to be the deacon Philip. A guy who is full of the Holy Spirit, just like Stephen was, full of that power and ability that Stephen was, so we can see how glorious this is. The rest of the deacons are not mentioned, like a lot of the disciples are not mentioned again. You know, but they did, they did their work. But these guys were picked out for, for a specific reason, as an example. And we know this Philip as Philip the Evangelist. That's how we often refer to him. However, it's important to know that here is the first great evangel evangelistical outreach outside of Jerusalem. Remember what's just happened at Jerusalem? They've all been kicked out. The big great diaspora has happened. Uh, all the Jew Jewish Christians are going all over the place. And some of them have come down into Samaria and they've started preaching just like, uh, just like Philip has. Now we could call Philip uh, what an English term is, uh, a layman. We all know what a layman is, don't we? He's a person who either works in the church, or works for the church, or, or does some ministry, but he's not, he, uh, 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 doesn't hold an office within the church. You know, we don't have laymen because we're Baptists, we just have normal Christians, but that's the term that's, that's used. So he was just a normal person. You know, he was a deacon, yes, but the deacons were there to serve. Uh, the first, and this is the first time the term evangelist is used uh, with being associated with a person. Now, Philip preached and proclaimed Christ and evangelised glad tidings, the, the, things, the, things, the things concerning God. I'm getting lost over my words. But when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God, this is what he preached, this is what he spoke about. Uh, he was a true servant of God. And he was made from the same stuff as Stephen. He was willing, he was Jewish, and he was willing to go to these dogs, the Samaritans, and preach the glorious gospel message to them. And there's a lot, as, as, um, as I mentioned last week, there's a lot of racism, a lot of prejudice between the Jews and the Samaritans. And, this, and we see this in this chapter in, in the background. Now, great revival often, often necessitates the saints going out and preaching and witnessing uh, to the lost. Uh, a lot of people going out willing to preach Christ, just like the example of Philip here, going to people we don't even like, but, you know, perhaps who uh, society puts out, puts out of our reach, you know, the, the untouchables, those people that we're not supposed to talk to, you know, like when the, like when the Salvation Army would go into the pubs to collect money, you know, a lot of Christians would say, oh, you, you can't do that, that's, Ooh, we can't go into a pub. Well, that's where the sinners are. So that's where the gospel needs to go. You know? I, I, know, I know of a gentleman who would go into the, uh, what would you call them? He called, he's American, so they call them hen houses. Um, whore houses. And he goes in. Brothel, brothels. Brothels. Yeah. Brothels, sorry. He goes into the brothels and he pays and he sits and he witnesses to them. And he said, loads of them to the Lord. Mm -hmm. And then because of their experiences, they go out and then reach mm -hmm. other women in the same position. And even help take women away from that situation. So there's a great work being done. When we dare to go out and witness to those people who society says we shouldn't touch. So that's what's, hap that's what's happening here. In Acts chapter 11, verses 19 through 21... Acts chapter 11, verses 19 through to 21. We see a truth there. It says, Now they which were scattered abroad upon the persecution that arose about Stephen travelled as far as Phoenice, Phoenice and Cyprus and Antioch, preaching the word to none but the Jews only. And some of them were men of Cyprus and Cyrene, Gentiles, which when they were come to Antioch spake to the Grecians preaching the Lord Jesus Christ. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned unto the Lord. A few short sentences there, we see the same thing happening. 
They go to speak to the Jews and then the Gentiles and a great many people are saved. Well, we see the essentials for, for revival here in verse 6. It says, And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles that he did. The people must be of one accord. They must uh, be of one mind, one spirit, one purpose, uh, in full cooperation, you know, willing to hear the message and to see the miracles. You know, oftentimes we're happy to hear the message, but we fail to see the miracles that are there. Just like, what's his name? Come in, Andrew. Come, come in out of hospital. Colin, sorry. Colin. <laughs> Colin coming out of hospital, you know? What a miracle. Alan. 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 Colin, you know, all of them. Yeah, the miracles that we fail to see every day that happen around us. We're happy to hear the word, but we fail to see the miracles. This is why I write things down, you know, so I can remember them. <laughs> if people oppose and shut their ears and close their eyes uh, to the messenger, they, they cannot have revival. They cannot have their hearts, their souls revived. Their lives will stay will stay the, the same. There has to be an openness, a willingness uh, to listen to what is being said, to hear the word of God, to hear what the evangelist is saying to them. Oftentimes you'll try to witness to somebody and as soon as they know what you're doing, they'll close their ears off. Then they won't listen to what you're saying because they're going back on what they were taught before. You know, they may be staunch um, evolutionists, and just because you're talking about God, you may not even touch that area. Well, because you're talking about God, they insta they're instantly turned against you. They've shut their ears and closed their eyes to what could be a glorious message. You know, when you witness to somebody and they say, oh, I don't believe, uh, I don't believe in creation. Well, that's fine. You need to believe in Jesus. We can deal with that later on. The people must give heed, keep their minds and hearts open to the message. If that happens then there, is, there will be true blessings. Look at Acts chapter 17 and verse 11. Acts chapter 17, verse 11. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. So they received the word with readiness and then they searched the scriptures to make sure that these things were so. And that, hap that happens when somebody starts to hear the word, it starts to work in their hearts, and then they, then, then they believe. They want to know, they want to understand, they want to believe. And then the belief comes along. The faith is built upon. There's a lot of people who know the scriptures. They know about God. They know about heaven and hell and everything else refuse to believe. You know, the devil knows more about the Bible than any of us. Look at verses uh, 7 through, uh, yeah, verse 7 of our text. For unclean spirits, crying with loud voice, I've oh, missed a verse, have I missed a verse? And the people with one accord gave, yeah, gave heed to those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles of which he did. For unclean spirits, crying with a loud voice, came out of many that were possessed with them, and many taken with pulses, and that were lame, were healed. So the, the, here is a, an evidence, the first evidence of revival, that lives are changed. Here they're changed for these specific reasons. But lives are changed every time uh, a revival happens in somebody's heart every time that the Holy Spirit enters into somebody's heart. You ask Mad John over there, who's now called Bible John. Life's change. You know, this, these things happen to a greater or a lesser extent. Thank you, Jay. And when our life change, it changes for the better. People who cannot help themselves are healed. Evil spirits are cast out. People with diseased and crippled bodies are healed. We see this happening. 
You know, we pray for people and we see this happen. We've heard the word, but sometimes we just fail to see that miracle that, that has happened. The power of God is clearly visible in somebody's life. You know, I've met some people uh, and they've said to me, I, you know, I, I'm a Christian now. I remember a chap uh, that I used to work with and he said, I'm a Christian. And I knew him at school and he wasn't a Christ, very Christian at school. I can tell you that. Now he's completely different. Or well, when I met him, he was completely different because of this change that is in our, our lives when we believe in, in this word. A second evidence, uh, look at verse 8. It says, and there was great joy in that city. Great joy in that city. It was experienced by everybody. A person who truly comes to know Christ is filled with joy. You know, how many times do we hear oh, about such and such got saved? And going, yeah, that's great. There should be joy and another soul is added to the kingdom of heaven. Another sinner is saved from the fires of hell. Sins are forgiven. We have the joy that our sins are forgiven, the joy of deliverance, the joy of the power to live, life everlasting, life more abundance, as Christ says. We have the joy of eternity, the joy of knowing God's presence in our lives, and the joy of security and assurance. It doesn't matter what, if I die tomorrow, I know where I will be. You know, I may be a little worried about the bang before it happens, but... We know where we will be. The third evidence is in verse 9. It says, But there was a certain man called Simon, which before in, before in the same city used sorcery and bewitched the people in Samaria, giving out that himself was some great one. So evidence three is that there, from the depths of sin, false prophets and false religion and sorcery various types will appear. The depth of sin was so deep for these people and they were gripped and enslaved by the error, the false teaching and the false hope that was there. They were so gripped by this. You know, there's false prophets today and there's false religions and there's, there's people that come up with all kinds of crazy ideas and, and you know, when... When a church is being successful in, as in reaching people, as in edifying people, or building them up, you just know the devil's going to get in there somewhere. He's going to want to get his foot in the door. He's going to want to stir things up. And we've seen that in the past. We've all seen it happen before. The devil gets in through, an, through a false teacher or a false prophet or a false religion or an error in teaching that is put forth. Trouble starts. Look at verse 9 again. It says, but there was a certain man called Simon. Now think of this man called Simon. What did he do? It says in verse 10, to whom they all gave heed from the least to the greatest, saying this man is a great man of God. The people had been enslaved by a false prophet, an imposter called Simon. He used sorcery magical arts, witchcraft, spirit mediums, whatever they were, astrology, charm spells, uh, fortune telling, you know, there's, there's a lot of them that today, they're just thought of as silliness, but they have a, their roots are in some quite horrific and uh, de demon-possessed things, if you look into the history of them. He bewitched people, that means he amazed them, he astonished them, he astounded them, so that he could secure their following, so that they would be loyal to him, to what his word, to what he says. He declared that he was some great one, probably the Messiah. We know that we know of Judas and Thaddeus uh, that uh, before Christ that Gamaliel spoke about uh, when he was talking uh, when he was talking to the Sanhedrin about Peter. Uh, and, and John, that they rose up and they come, came to nothing, he said, and there was others after them. In fact, uh, if you look at Jewish history all the way up to about the 12th century, uh, I think the last one was a Spanish guy, Men Menonides, I think his name was, uh, claimed to be, the, be uh, the Messiah. 
so that it's all through their history. So this is what he claimed to be, some great one. And the people had been enslaved by his false religion. You know, all false religions and false teachings, do they come from God or do they come from man? They all come from man. So it's always somebody's false belief that started it off. They all gave heed. They all followed his leadership and his teaching. All from the least to the greatest confessed that this man was the great power of God. That could be not other thought than the Messiah. So think how gullible people are, are today in following false uh, prophets and false teachers and false religions. You know, we, I know some really, really nice people who are following a false religion, who are following false teachings, and they won't listen. You try witnessing to a Jehovah's Witness, you know, the witnessing goes out the window then. They don't, they don't want to know. They'll, they'll walk away. If they come to your door and you start witnessing to them, they'll walk off. I've stood outside, I've stood outside Rico Arena in Coventry when they were having the national convention. I think it was, was it 380,000 Jehovah's Witnesses gathered together for the national convention and there was about 12 of us with placards, you know, not saying you will burn in hell, but you know, trying to witness to these people. And they were even turning the children's heads so that they couldn't see as we drove past. And we got to the point where we were so frustrated uh, my friend, John Heppelwhite, if he's watching, he'll remember this, with, his, with the megaphone, actually started shouting at them, come and talk to me, I want you to witness to me. They didn't want to know. They didn't want to enter that area. Because they knew. We did actually get quite a lot of tracks handed out because there was a car park on the other side of the train tracks with a tunnel going underneath, and we dressed in black suits with a load of tracks printed out welcome to the rico arena and just stood there and handed them out and we got through thousands of these tracks before the security came and moved us on but that's in my in my, my younger days but verse where are we? verse eight and there was great joy in that city verse 10 to whom they all gave heed verse 11 let's try that one and to him they had regard because that of a long time he had bewitched them with sorceries. And then in verse, wow. verse 12, <laughs> we have evidence number four, forgive me. But when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptised, both men and women. So here they are all bewitched by Simon. All following, listening to him, thinking he's a great man of God. And then Philip comes along and starts witnessing to them. And they turn to Philip, who points them towards God. And they listen to Philip. This is evidence number four, believing. And then they were baptised. The people believed the things concerning God that Philip was teaching and the name of Jesus Christ. And after that, they were baptised. Now, Philip preached two major subjects. He preached the kingdom of God and he preached the name of Jesus Christ. These are the two things that we preach. Look at Matthew chapter 10 with me. Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10 and verse 7. And as you go, preach, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, why, Jesus told us to do that, but why is it so important to, when we preach to say that the kingdom of heaven is at hand? Because what could, be, what could come as a thief in the night? You know, it could all be over in, in the flash of an eye. We need to tell people that today is the day of salvation. Today you need to get saved because the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's very close to us. And we see here in Acts chapter 8, verse 12. But when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ. The name of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was a Jew. Why would Samaritans believe in a Jew? Can we, can we see what's going on here? 
even though we have this great disparity between these two groups of people, the truth is being preached and it's being believed. It's being understood. It's being de devoured by them. When people heard the message, they believed and they were baptised because of that belief. Evidence number five, look at verse 13. Then Simon himself, now this is the guy who had them bewitched, uh, made himself some great thing of God. Then Simon himself believed also, surprise. And when he was baptised, he continued with Philip and wondered, beholding the miracles and signs which were done. Now it is doubtful that Simon was making a genuine confession of Christ, as we see later on in the chapter. But when there are people who experience revival in their hearts, when people get saved, there will always be some false professions, some counterfeits. The devil will want, as I said, to be in, some, in there in some form. Remember that Jesus gathers his sheep in the sheepfold, he lies across the entrance, and where do the thieves? And they, they come over the wall, and they get in amongst the sheepfold. They don't come through the door of Jesus Christ. They get in some other way, a false way. Evidence number six, verses 14 to 17. Now when the apostles, now the apostles which were at Jerusalem, heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent out Peter and John. Why Peter and John? These were the 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 battle lords of the, of the Christian faith. These were the guys that constantly went back to Solomon's porch to preach, would put in prison, went back to preach, were taken before the Sanhedrin, went back to preach. You know, these guys were not afraid of anything. They were, so they were definitely weren't afraid of going into Samaria. Uh, who, when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. For as yet... He was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptised in the name of the Lord Jesus. Verse 17. Then laid they their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. Now this is evidence number six, and this is quite controversial, so I want you to bear with me on this. Now, the apostles we know were leaders. These were the twelve, uh, well the eleven and the next one who was voted in that were chosen by the Lord Jesus, uh, the supervisors of the church uh, as a whole. That's why they stayed in Jerusalem. Uh, and this was one of the re reasons they could send out the apostles to ascertain that these people truly believed and there was a church there to be built. So they sent Peter and John to investigate, uh, but why was an investigation necessary? It was necessary because of this bitter enmity, racial prejudice between the Jews and the Samaritans. Remember somebody said to Jesus, what, shall we, go to the, shall we go to the Samaritans also? You know? How ridiculous. Shall we go to the Gentiles? Laughing? Yes, that's exactly what he wanted. When Peter and John arrived, what did they discover? They discovered that the Samaritans had believed and been baptised. But the Holy Spirit had not fallen upon any of them yet. Now, this is a puzzling passage or what we would often call a mystery. It's not a mystery as in the sense that there's no answer. It's a mystery in the sense that there is an answer. It's just not in plain sight at the moment. Um, it's a mystery to some because the Samaritans are said to have already believed and been baptised. Yet the Holy Spirit had not fallen upon them. They had not yet received him. That leaves a big question mark. So there's four, there's four things to consider here. First of all, there's no legitimate question about the Samaritans being truly saved. Now, Philip knew the Lord. He knew the Lord. And he was filled with the Spirit himself. We see that back in Acts chapter, chapter 6. He possessed the power of the Spirit, as we see in verses 6 and 7. And he preached the gospel in clear terms so that the Samaritans could understand it. So he, he knew how people were saved and what was involved in salvation. Therefore, two things are unthinkable and impossible. One, that Philip actually did not proclaim the full gospel, 
This position could, will be contrary to what the scripture say, actually says. Or that Philip could be deceived by all the people. And this position, again, would be contrary to the spirits leading in Philip's life. And his power to witness. The scripture says that uh, in Romans chapter 8 verse 9, that if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. So how could these have been of Jesus Christ if they hadn't been saved? If a person is truly saved, the Holy Spirit has entered their heart and their life right then and there. Scripture is abundantly clear on this point. So in light of these two facts, the Samaritans apparently had two experiences of the Holy Spirit. Now that's not as surprising as it sounds at face value. The Holy Spirit actually entered their hearts and lives when they believed and when they were born again, becoming new creatures uh, and evidence in this public, publicly through baptism. The Holy Spirit fell upon them and poured himself out in field, came upon them and manifested his presence and power on this very special occasion when Peter and John visited the new believers. Think back just a little bit to what happened to Stephen. Was Stephen filled with the Holy Ghost? He was from the start. But at the end, the Holy, Spirit, Holy Ghost came upon him and he had the vision of heaven. So there was an extra, extra almost, almost like Ribena. You know, when your mother gives you Ribena and it's really weak and watery, and then when you have it yourself, it's really strong. Yeah. And as an example, exactly what you're talking about here, it, it was an example uh, uh, to the Samaritans and the Jews that God had accepted the Samaritans into his family. Now, before they went down to Samaria, who were Christians? Jews, Jews just Jews. And they went out and they preached too just Jews. They went in the synagogues and they preached just to Jews. Now they're going into Samaria. Now who, who, who was in Samaria? What were these people? Samaritans, Samaritans yeah, but what? They were a mix, a mix of Jews. That's right. Jewish and Gentile. They were a mixed race. When Nehemiah came back to build, rebuild Jerusalem, some other of the exiles came back and they'd been in exile for 70 years. So some of the young, younger ones hadn't even seen the promised land. A lot of them didn't even speak Hebrew. And at one point, uh, Nehemiah actually grabbed them by the head. He said he grabbed them by the head and shook them because they couldn't speak their mother language. You know, so that's how, what they consider the Samaritans to be half-breeds, below them, impure. They'd gone off and they're, and they're bred with, with idols and idol worshippers. This was where all this came from. So this is, the, this is why they have this racial prejudice against them, why this barrier existed, and why God had to smash this barrier down with that Holy Spirit experience for them to be fully accepted. It happens again a little bit later on. In fact, we often hear of the Jewish Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, which is the proper Pentecost. There's only one, really. This is what they say. And then we have the Samaritan Pentecost, which we have here, here, Acts chapter 8. And then we have what they call the Gentile Pentecost in Acts chapter 10. All incidents of the Holy Spirit showing the Jews and showing everybody else that these three groups of people are accepted into the family of God. So we come to evidence number seven. All the way down to verse 19. Sorry, verse 18. And, 19. And, when, and when Simon saw that through laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me also this power that on whomsoever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. Now this is the, the rebuke of hypocrisy. The point is clearly seen in this account of Simon. 
how much of a, hip, a hip, hypocrite he was. First of all, we detect that hypocrisy in his desire for power, prestige, and influence, secretly wanting to regain the power and the position that he previously had. Looks how much spitfire is going on overhead. Verse 20 to 21, he says, he says there, but Peter said unto him, thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. So there we see the judgment of hypocrisy. Your heart is not right with God. Repent or you will perish. You have no part of the Spirit. In fact, that is the, the expression simony has to do with this act right here. He's trying to buy a position of power, particularly in the church, in the ecclesiastical order, with money. You, you sometimes see this if you watch the movie uh, about the popes, the two popes, and there was another, another movie where they were trying to choose which pope was next, and one of them was you know, garnering favour with, with money and, and, and land. That's simony, that's what he was doing. We see the answer to hypocrisy in verse 22. Repent, therefore, of this thy wickedness, and pray God, if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven, may be forgiven thee. This is the answer to hypocrisy. Now, this man put himself up there to be something of God and had people in his thrall. And then when uh, Philip came along, he sided with Philip so that he could try and get some of that power back. Now he's been found out. And what's the answer to somebody living in hypocrisy? Well, hypocrisy is a sin, isn't it? Just like every other sin. The answer is to repent and pray and turn from your sin. And then what happens to him? Look at verse 23. For I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. So that was his problem. That's why he was being hypocritical. He was bitter because his power and his authority had been taken away with him and he was in the bond of iniquity. He was building, his sin was building up and up and up. He was bitter, he was full of malice, he was enslaved to sin. Verse 24, then, and this is the beautiful thing. Then answered Simon and said, pray ye to the Lord for me that none of these things which ye have spoken come upon me. So he was aware of his wrong motive for deliverance, to escape judgment. He didn't show any sor sorrow when he was selfish, but now he is sorry, he's sorrowful for the things that he's done. And the last evidence, number eight, says verse 25, and they, when they had testified and preached the word of the Lord, returned to Jerusalem and preached the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. So the Jews, Peter and John, returned back to Jerusalem. And on the way, they stopped at as many villages in Samaria as they could because they had seen what had happened, that God had accepted the Samaritans and that they needed to be preached to. The, opening of their hearts for evangelism before they thought no just for the jews not for the gentiles not for the the samaritans definitely not for the gentiles perhaps but now they're seeing what god is doing and they're rejoicing and they're going out and they're witnessing to everybody how open the samaritans were to the jewish preachers of the gospel at the start just think about that reverse reverse the order what did the samaritans think about the jews they thought they were so uh, you know, on their high horses, they were so self-important, they then, you know, yet they'd come down to witness and preach to them. How the apostles went to village, from village to village in Samaria to preach after realising, as I've said, that God had accepted the Samaritans. It says in Acts chapter 4, verse 20, says, well, we cannot but speak the things that we have seen and heard. We can't help but preach the things that we've seen and we've heard. That's the important thing. And in 2 Corinthians 4.13, we have the same spirit of faith according as it is written in here. 
I believed, therefore I have spoken. We also believe and therefore speak. Somebody believed and spoke the gospel message to us. We believed and we speak. May God bless this word to us. Any 